Hello, welcome to Scott's Odyssey, the beautiful sleepy town of Catawissa, Pennsylvania, home to forests, farms, religious diversity, vampires, and werewolves. Wait, vampires and werewolves? See you in a minute. Welcome back. If you've watched my videos before, thank you for your patronage. And if you're new to Scott's Odyssey, welcome aboard. Here we find ourselves at Old Mount Zion Cemetery, established by the Mount Zion Methodist Congregation. Well, until 1874, when they built their new church and established a graveyard next to it. What? Cemetery versus graveyard. Right. Well, a cemetery is a designated location for burial practices. Historically, those that are underground or in catacombs, but also for those who are interred in the earth. A graveyard is a cemetery with one extra condition. It's part of the lot of an established church, often referred to as the churchyard. Back to Old Mount Zion Cemetery, or as it's now called, the Hooded Grave Cemetery. And I have no idea why or who changed the name. Maybe the Methodists wanted to attract macabre visitors or just didn't like who was buried here, so they cast them out or something. If you have a remnant of history that defines the name change, leave a comment below or reach out to me through other means. Regardless of the reason, the Hooded Grave Cemetery is the location for formerly at least three, but now only two Hooded Grave Sites. The only two that exist in the entire North American continent. Well, except for Billy the Kid's grave at Fort Sumner in New Mexico, which was added in 1950 because his headstone was stolen three different times in the 1940s. So the question remains, why are there two hooded graves here in Pennsylvania? Unlike other videos and stories by historians, I'm going to do this investigative story backward and start with the theory of these being mort safes. Some historians state, and I quote, with extreme confidence these devices are mort safes, but I disagree. The only reason why these people call them mort safes is because, well, they don't know any better. It's the non-investigative historian trying to make correlation become causation, and well, that's not how it works. What is it that makes them believe they are mort safes? Well, the fact that these people are Buried beneath the cages are of Scottish descent, and in Scotland, more safes were very rare, but they existed. You heard that right, more safes were rare, or at least extremely uncommon. They were only commonly found in cemeteries that were close to medical centers. Like, really close. We're talking cemeteries only found on the medical center's facilities. At least that is according to the history of more safe which can be found by visiting Marshall Museum in Aberdeen, Scotland, where they actually have a working model. The mort safe arose in 1816 as a deterrent in stopping the exhuming of a recently deceased body for the purposes of medical experimentation and anatomy exploration. The mort safe was a heavy iron plate with holes in it that was slightly larger than the interred plot. Then iron rods attached to another plate were pushed down into the holes and the entire device was padlocked. Sometimes a heavy stone was laid on top of the upper iron plate. When we say iron rods, we are talking about half inch to one inch thick rods, the kind that do not bend very easily, much like what you would find on the eight foot tall older wrought iron fences occasionally found around former institutions and government facilities. Not like the kind you find around the much smaller property fencing. These devices were put in place for six weeks. Why six weeks? Well, if you were laid to rest on top of the ground, nothing of your remains would be left after about four weeks. Because these bodies were not exposed to open air, which lets natural bacteria decompose a body much more quickly, they gave them six weeks to reach a point of putridity and decay that would make the bodies unusable in medical science. Were they only used at cemeteries outside of medical facilities? Well, not exactly. You see, when they cut off the access to usable bodies from outside of the medical facilities, 
there were those whom would start to raid the graves further away in other people's cemeteries. So some churches would rent the mort safes not being used by the medical facilities and implement them on their property as well. And as time went on, only 16 years to be exact, the mort safe usage came to an end in 1832 with the passage of the Anatomy Act of 1832, an act of parliament of the United Kingdom giving free license to doctors, teachers of anatomy, and bona fide medical students the ability to legally dissect donated bodies. That is to say bodies donated to science through an individual's final wishes, a family's final wishes, and bodies of the poorhouse or workhouse, otherwise known as the poverty-stricken people who were part of the UK institution, thereby making their remains the property of the UK. This was not the first attempt to pass legislation to stop body snatching. In 1828, there was a drop in body snatching as well as a more than 90% drop and the use of mort safes due to the initiation of what was called the Warburton Anatomy Bill, which made headlines and was the talk of the time. Unfortunately, the Warburton Anatomy Bill failed in the House of Lords for undisclosed reasons, only to be redrafted with different language that redefined what donated meant, mostly just to get around the former language that gave access to anyone who was considered unclaimed. With the passage of the Anatomy Act of 1832, stories of body snatching just disappeared, with only a few occasions where bodies were taken for more nefarious acts and not for medical experimentation. So, to recap, mort safes appeared in 1816, were down 90% of usage just 12 years later in 1828, and by 1832 were no longer used. They disappeared so fast that these mort safes that were set up less than six weeks prior to the passing of the 1832 Act pretty much remained abandoned at their last site of installation for all time, which is where we get all of our current historical pictures of how they were installed and what they looked like. That's right, the usage of a mort safe stopped in 1832. Now, back here in Pennsylvania, there was a movement around called Resurrectionism, a bunch of people who firmly believed the dead should be used to push forward our knowledge of medicine and anatomy through the research of recently dead bodies. Same as what was going on over in Scotland and England. But here's the problem. There is no medical and was no medical facility even remotely near this part of Pennsylvania. The ones that did exist were in Philadelphia, who received corpses through legal means ever since 1832 with the Pennsylvania Anatomy Act of 1832. Those here under a cage at this location were not interred until the 1850s. Although there were grave robbers in America, the only recorded grave robbing in the 1850s was one in Cleveland, Ohio, in which the culprits who were caught were handled quite violently due to the need to perform public assuage so as not to have another repeat of the resurrectionist riots of 1845 where citizens went with pitchfork and torch in hand all after those who were receiving bodies snatched from local potter's fields, or rather the fields where the poor and indigent were buried. Now back to our hooded graves from 1852, 20 years later and a pond away from where the mort safe originated. Aside from there being no real reason for these to be mort safe, there are some other key differences. These cages are very decorative and thin. They were definitely not designed for the typical six-week usage as designated for the actual mort safes. And there was no known mort safes anywhere in the United States at this time. Let's take a moment to look at who is placed in these sites and what we can determine from that information. The two graves with cages are Sarah Ann Thomas Boone, who died on June 18th of 1852 at age 22, and Azeneth B. Campbell Thomas, who died on June 26th of 1852 at age 20. The third formerly caged grave is that of Rebecca S. Thomas Clayton, who died on May 12th, 1852 at age 25. The death dates of all three young women is something that is really odd. So here we have two sisters and a sister-in-law who were all extremely close in age and all died within one month of each other with no record for the reason of death. Now, some people say Azeneth was a cousin to Sarah Ann and Rebecca, but if you look at the family line, both Sarah Ann and Azenith's husband, John F. Thomas, 
were both children of Lloyd and Frances Thomas, making Azeneth a sister-in-law to Sarah Ann and not her cousin. Some historians and local authorities also state that only one man is buried in the known 24 plots and spread that information around often, but in reality there are two men over 50 and six known males under the age of 12. Curious to that point, most of them died very young and during the earlier parts of the 1850s, much like our three hooded grave young ladies. The 1850s were renowned for taking young people, mostly due to cholera, which based on the ages of the children below the age of 16 is a highly likely reason, especially the multiples who were less than two years of age. But as for the 20 year olds, this may or may not be true. You see, although cholera was taking the lives of one in every three, the statistics is one in every three of those who were not affluent or wealthy people, more specifically the poor. With money or being well known, you would have received good medical care and with constant hydration, your chances of dying to cholera dropped to less than 1%. Unless maybe their religion prevented having a doctor, which again is highly unlikely because they were Methodists. And aside from most medical facilities being owned and run by the Catholic Church, the Methodists were second in line for being at the top of the 1850s medical care and hospice. So were these young ladies affluent? Were they wealthy by any means? <laughs> As it turns out, they were all very well to do and their parents were quite wealthy. Take Sarah Ann, for example. She kept the name of Sarah Ann Thomas, but was, as stated on her stone, consort to Ranslow Boone. Now, here comes another fallacy put out by people. The stone says she was his consort. They automatically attribute her to being a whore or a live-in lover. But at this time, and based on Scottish tradition, a consort was what you called a wife when married to a form of nobility. There are other variations of the nobility aspects, but the common theme of consort is a wife, not a live-in whore. Sarah Ann Thomas and Renslow Boone even had a registered wedding license in the archives with the county. So she was his wife who bore him a daughter just 16 days before she died. And Renslow Boone was known throughout the county for being the pinnacle grocery and dry goods distributor. So yeah, we have affluence with Sarah Ann. Likewise with both Azeneth and Rebecca, both married and of fair wealth. But something interesting is also trending in this information. Azeneth B. Campbell Thomas is listed as passing on June 26th of 1852, but she gave birth to Azeneth Thomas on June 27th of 1852. And Rebecca S. Thomas Clayton had no children. So both Sarah Ann and Azeneth B. were both pregnant during the time they passed, where Azneth died in childbirth and Sarah just a couple of weeks later. But Rebecca also died during the time and was not pregnant as far as anyone knows. That rules out death in childbirth as the reason for death, but does not rule out the cause of death. I really wanted to default back to cholera for the cause, but due to the fact that the two women that were pregnant made it through their pregnancy, Cholera would have stricken the infants and killed them before they were born. But there is the issue of Azneth dying in childbirth and the fact that her daughter made it four months longer before she too died, suggesting a premature birth. Maybe there's more information in the story of what was going on around them at that time. So more than being worried about being dug up by grave robbers selling to resurrectionists who in turn would distribute bodies to the pre-med students at a medical college almost 100 miles away was to stop people from, I don't know, maybe digging up the alleged vampire, putting a stake in their chest, rearranging their bones, burning their hearts. And the list goes on on how to take care of that problem. So let's dive into the theory of vampirism and lycanthropy. One of the rumors for covering the graves is due to vampirism or lycanthropy. Why would someone say that these women were vampires or werewolves? Let's take another step back and look at what wealthy people were doing during the mid 1800s. Oh, that's right. It was the Victorian era, the time of hair work, vibrators for hysteria, 
photos with your dead family members, stuffed birds on your hat, stuffed squirrels on your hat, stuffed cats on your hat, other crazy taxidermy arts with any animal you can imagine. No, really, if you could imagine it, someone would take two different dead animals and create things from your wildest sick fantasy, not to mention all the anthropomorphic dioramas, ultimately leading to death parties, mummy consumptions. <laughs> yes, they ate the body of sarcophagi mummies. And the darkest of the dark arts, the freak shows. I digress. It must be acknowledged that the Victorian area was a time period of absolute enamor with the morbid, macabre, and anything to do with death and the deceased. Whether it was from wearing radioactive makeup, eating dead people, progressive liberalism, and the death of conservatism, which, oddly enough, we kind of see... <laughs> Never mind. Again, Victorian area was just plain weird. As much as I would love to blame their mental states and cultural attributes on the fact that they saw lots of death surrounding their lives, the only real death they were witnessing here in the States were the same ones that have always been around, except maybe the occasional blue plague or cholera, which was typically only affecting the poor. And these women were not poor. But in this area of Pennsylvania, there was a real issue taking place that may explain all the vampire and werewolf panic. You see, aside from news in New England, constantly talking about the vampire epidemic and werewolves to the point that even Henry David Thoreau spoke about this in his journals, there was another reason for concern and why you would think people were turning into vampires. It was also an issue that would kill you, but not your newly born child. Tuberculosis, more commonly known as consumption, and at this time it was aptly named the White Plague. Historically, we don't think about tuberculosis until 1895 and then heavily through and up until 1945. But the reality is it was around and spreading through this area in the 1850s and was known for making you wickedly pale with dark circles around your eyes and mouth, similar what we would refer to as, well, a vampire or even a werewolf. Although, if we're going to go with mythical creatures, I would just rule out werewolf or some form of lycanthropy or even modernly the blood disorder of lupus, because even though it could have been a cause for a person's appearance to be like the white plague, you don't catch lupus from other people. It's a genetic hereditary disease. But to further the vampire tale, although I cannot find it anywhere but in the retold stories from questionable sources, so it's subjective, it's said that Sarah Ann's parents believed that she died from a vampire bite and they caged her plot so she couldn't get out. And again, I digress. I do not believe these cages were erected to keep in a vampire. They are far too flimsy to hold back a creature that just clawed its way through a financially well-to-do, probably ornate coffin or casket, and then clawed its way up through six feet of dirt. <laughs> yeah, I think the vampire could easily dislodge or just rip through these cages. And while we're at it, the vampire could probably turn into a bat and fly out, or mind control some idiot along the way to just come and open the cage for them. Now that we are probably on the right path, albeit subjectively, I believe these women died from the White Plague. But why are they in cages? Quite simply because it was the Victorian era, and these women were from money. You see, these cages are for decorative purposes. This exact design during this exact time period was used on Victorian cages, specifically for the purpose of growing flowers or containing a bird. The design was most popular from 1848 through 1855 and was a style that came out of the Vaucluse portion of France. I know this video is going to ruffle a lot of feathers of local historians who will want to argue what I postulate here but they will also be the same people who argue that the girls were cousins and not in-laws, or that these are mort safes, even though those types of grave devices were not needed due to laws passed 20 years previous, and nobody in this area 
wanted or needed a dead body. I hope you enjoyed learning about this site as much as I enjoyed researching the facts of what was possibly going on to have people put up hooded cages over top of these young women's graves. It is always fascinating what comes to the front of history when you open your mind to what was going on during that time period and not just focus on a single aspect of a remnant or a curiosity that was left behind. Only when you look at the whole picture do you finally realize who we once were and have a better understanding of who we are now. As always, I thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.